Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm Pauline Davies, and uh, this is uh, one of our Cancer and the Nature of Life discussions, and it's going to be a treat today. But before I go on to today's event, I want to mention the next one. So it's going to be in three weeks, and we'll have James D. Gregori, and he's from the University of Colorado School of Medicine, and his top title will be Aging and Disease, Must They Go Together? And I just want to give you the times because I know there's a time change. So that's at 12 p.m. Arizona time, 11 a.m. Um, Pacific time, and 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And the registration details and the times are up on our website, Arizona Cancer Evolution Center. But right now I want to welcome Dr. Tara Harrison. Tara is a cancer researcher with ACE, and she's a vet from North Carolina State University. She also does cancer research and she works with exotic animals. I mean, it sounds so exciting. Ca uh, Tara uh, looks after them and uh, prevents them getting cancer and treats them when they do. And I know Tara has been very busy this morning. She's been looking after a baboon. I don't even know if that baboon was alive or dead. Maybe Tara will it's tell us. It's still alive. It's still alive. It's still alive. Okay. And Tara's talk today is called Scaly Cancers, an overview of cancer in reptiles. And after Tara's talk, Zachary Compton, who's a doctoral candidate with us in ACE, and he studies cancer evolution, will be posing questions to Tara. So send in your questions. And uh, you, the, there's also going to be a chat screen open and you can just chat amongst yourselves. So Tara, over to you. All right, thank you so much. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to just go over some of the research we've done with reptiles and their cancers, as well as uh, just a general overview. Uh, so some of it's obviously very medical based, but uh, I'll try to get it at as broad of a way as possible. So anyway, uh, the first disclaimer, I'm not an oncologist. So I do uh, especially like researching cancer in reptiles and uh, studying it and basically anything not domestic. I'm a specialist in zoo medicine, so I'm a veterinarian and a clinician first, but I do certainly like this research and have been looking into it quite a bit. Uh, so uh, just going to try to give a general overview of what's going on. Uh, there are other publications out there, at least on how to diagnose, treat, et cetera, uh, in reptiles, as in shown here in this paper uh, that is available. And uh, there's certainly other ones that are out there too. Uh, I'll go into why some of these studies could potentially be better and how we're working with ACE to try to improve that. So the first thing is, a lot of people are like, well, how do you even tell if it's cancer? Uh, some of them are very small. Some of them are very large. Some of these animals live for hundreds of years. Uh, like alligator snapping turtles can live well over 100 years. And basically the way that I diagnose it is the same as anything else. So basically you take a sample, take a blood sample. We do radiographs. We do uh, ultrasound, CT scans, all of those things. Uh, so it's all very similar. So step one, finding out, does it have cancer? Uh, sometimes it's harder than it seems. Um, if it's a venomous animal, if it's an animal that's dangerous, it involves a bit more than just going up and taking a sample. All right. So the types of diagnostics, like I said, these are some of them. This is not a reptile. It's actually a tenrec, uh, but basically the this is pre-treatment post-treatment ct scans and just showing uh how that can improve uh but usually we can see where it's at and what's abnormal on ct scan and this tenrec actually weighed about 170 grams so we can do this on very tiny things as well most of the diagnostics that we have, including ultrasound, uh, radiographs, endoscopy, CT, MRI, they're all human units uh, that are used for veterinary use. 
So the main thing I'm trying to get, at least for veterinarians and those who own reptiles, is to prevent uh, people from just euthanizing them the second that they diagnose them with neoplasia or cancer. Uh, so this is something that has come a long way in veterinary medicine. Obviously, if a person gets cancer, they're not euthanized. Uh, so for animals, that's the way it used to be. But I think a lot of people are more open to doing other treatments, including those that are in zoos, as well as owned as private pets. Uh, so that said, treatment's a little bit complicated. Uh, for some of them, they're very small. Some of them, they're very big. The other issues is compliance and dosing. For some of these animals, they only eat once a week, maybe once every other week or once a month. Uh, if they're sick, uh, some of the big snakes maybe may not eat for six months. Uh, so just giving medicine and food, it's not that easy, uh, or it's not something that's that reliable. Uh, so that can be a big challenge. Uh, the other thing is we don't actually have doses for them. We don't know what works. We have doses for people. We have doses for dogs, cats, maybe even horses. But for reptiles, we actually have no doses uh, or at least no controlled doses where we've done pharmacokinetic or pharmacodynamic studies to evaluate how it works in that animal. Uh, so we just don't even know. So a lot of the treatments we're doing are extrapolations from human and or uh, pet dog treatments uh, and hoping that we can figure it out. Most of these treatments are actually based on milligram per meter squared. And for many of these animals, we actually don't know how to calculate the body surface area. We don't have the constant or the K constant, which is in that equation, to even figure it out. So sometimes just like even being able to prescribe a dose that's realistic and safe uh, is hard. Uh, this is the equation and kind of where I start to figure out how do I figure out what the dose of this chemotherapy that's based on body surface area. A lot of work's been done for a lot of animals used in laboratory animal medicine. So for those animals, we can do that. Um, and then I basically look at that and see which one is most like the animal I'm treating and go from there. I then may change the dosing schedule. So like if mammals is every day and a reptile, maybe every three days might be better because they have a slower metabolism. So a lot of it is kind of uh, basically scientific guessing. That said, we are trying to do things, make it better. Uh, we actually did figure out the body surface area bearded dragons. Uh, so he took a CT scan and did a 3D reconstruction of the entire animal. So then we could use that to calculate an appropriate dose for the animal. We still don't know if the dose we're starting with is appropriate for reptiles or the dosing schedule, but at least we have a body surface area. So we have a starting point. So we started with this study. Uh, we have recently now moved on into doing that for amphibians as well as for snakes. And uh, those projects were done by some students this summer. So we're working on getting those results. So there's all sorts of other treatments that can be done in addition to like chemotherapy, uh, radiation, uh, there's also surgery. Uh, if you can completely cut out the tumor, obviously that's the best thing to do. Uh, but if you can't, then get as much of it out as possible. And that does help. So for reptiles, uh, basically I have found at least for some of them, they're pretty bad. Uh, for some of these reptiles, a lot of times everyone, or at least in the veterinary community, they're like, oh, it's a reptile. Everything happens slowly. Cancer doesn't seem to happen slowly in all the reptiles, which is very different than what we normally think of these animals. So it's certainly something that is disturbing to me, at least, and trying to give them the best care possible. 
So looking at snakes, there can be lumps, there can be bumps, it can be pretty much wherever. Usually what we do initially, snake comes in, may have a bump, we measure it, we do a CT scan so we can find out if they have any metastases. So then we know, all right, um, what type of treatment are we going to do? If it's something we can cut out, we cut it out. If it's already spread and metastasized, cutting it out may not be the best thing. Radiation treats more focal lesions, whereas chemotherapy is more for treating whole body. I think the biggest thing is a lot of these is to remember, if you see a bump on a snake, it's very much the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot more underneath. Almost always it's metastasized and almost always there's more than what you see. Uh, so that's certainly our biggest concern for that. For turtles, they're pretty much known as not really getting a whole lot of cancer. That said that they still do get some. Uh, so working with ACE and uh, we're the Exotic Species Cancer Research Alliance, uh, we also look in the literature and have found, uh, so we're trying to summarize what's published so we don't recreate the wheel and then also collecting the cases. Uh, what we found, at least through looking in the literature, is red-eared slider, Herman's tortoise, and the loggerhead are the most commonly reported. Uh, so it's certainly something that these get it, um, but is what's reported in the literature accurate? We all know that there's publication bias. Uh, you publish the cool things, the new things, the why wow, I treated it and it lived thing, uh, but there's obviously a lot more to it than that. So uh, looking at those, at least in the literature, uh, it seems that there's more females. There's been 26 types with squamous cell carcinoma was the one that we have seen the most, uh, as well as adenocarcinoma, and that about 24% of them metastasize. Uh, for looking at those not in the literature, we certainly have some of those cases as well. Uh, and we're still in the building and collecting phases. So that's why we're looking at the literature first to see, hey, what is that? And then is what we're finding with real cases where we look at everything, is that more? Uh, various treatments have been done. Probably the most common treatment that you're going to see in all of these is surgery. Uh, if you see it, cut it out, that's always the best. Uh, the next uh, most common then would be chemotherapy. There has been some electrochemotherapy. So that's basically you give uh, injection of it and then apply the electrodes to try to help stimulate that area. Uh, there's been variable survival times, but probably the longest lived was a Herman's tortoise that lived nine months post-treatment. So here is looking at the data. So um, what we've done, it's called um, Cox Boost, basically. So it forces the animals to stay in the equation so we can start making predictions about survival and other aspects of it. Uh, so basically uh, looking at this, this is like positive survival, the side is death due to cancer, uh, and then similar here. So we're not seeing like massive, huge effects, but we are seeing a significant response toward those that had complete surgical excision more likely to survive than those uh, that obviously weren't treated. So that's like, okay, that should make sense. Uh, that wasn't significant. That could be also that we just don't have as many cases that were treated, period. Uh, so remember, veterinary medicine is decently behind human medicine, uh, and treating zoo and exotic type animals is even further behind like dogs and cats. We've only really been treating most of these animals maybe for the last 15 years, which really isn't a long time when you look at it. Uh, so here are the types of cancer. So seeing sarcoma and squamous cell uh, more likely uh, to actually survive, uh, whereas adenocarcinoma and dysgerminoma, less likely. 
So again, these are based on the literature. These could be weird cases. Uh, normally, I also do see sarcomas uh, clinically not do well as well, but you know that's something else to be aware of. Just looking at, um, here's a case. So for example, this is uh, Mr. Fig. Uh, so he was hatched in 1969, so we actually know his uh, age. And so he had a mass that basically filled his salomic cavity. And you're like, how do you know that? It's all in a shell. Well, we actually could palpate it. So it's so big when you actually can palpate. And by palpating, you're basically sticking your fingers in the leg holes. And we were able to feel that. So we did a CT and found that he had a mass. We did use an ultrasound and took an aspirate from it and found out that it was a hepatic adenoma. He was treated uh, with radiation treatment. So here uh, is where the mass initially used to be. Uh, and then this is where it is now. So radiation did cause it to decrease. Uh, he is still alive and we initially treated him several years ago at this point now and still um, looking at him and treating him and evaluating him. I also do acupuncture. So he's one that I have done some acupuncture. So that's the traditional Chinese veterinary medicine. Uh, so I do that for some palliative uh, treatment or pain response due to cancer. The other thing that turtles also get a lot, and this is probably the sea turtles. Uh, so this is virally associated. So it's viral papillomas. This is something that affects quite a few sea turtles, uh, most commonly the green sea turtle, and it does cause strandings. Uh, it can be all around the flippers, can be around the eyes, can be in the oral cavity. Uh, so it can be something that causes quite a few problems uh, and can cause the death of that animal. The other thing with that is that it may also have a link with higher water temperatures, maybe with biotoxins, and or even potential link with pollution, which with all of those, like all of those are happening, all those are happening more. So it's potential to see more. Uh, I don't know if we have necessarily con like continuously had an increase of cases. It's more a steady. Uh, some animals, it will regress and then they are doing okay. Uh, go back to the wild and they may or may not have it again. Uh, so, because uh, herpes viruses are forever. Uh, so they may redevelop that lesion or not. Uh, treatment can be surgical removal. That may be something that if it's causing issues with the vision or with eating, if it's in the oral cavity, uh, but you can also have a secondary bacterial infection and it could also recur. Uh, some photodynamic therapy has also been used, but most of the time there's not a lot of treatments that are done. So going back to the snakes, uh, we decided to go deeper than just that initial literature review and looking at it. And also just because I've seen quite a few snakes when they come here, they're like, oh yeah, it's got a skin bump. Oh, it's been there for six months. We weren't worried about it. And then we do a CT scan and it is completely obliterated lungs with cancer and liver and the animal dies on the CT table. And you're like, okay, I wasn't planning on that. Uh, so it definitely seemed to be a big problem. So we looked at 133 snakes. We got records from uh, six institutions, zoos, museums, the veterinary school, et cetera, and not only got the cases of cancer, but also got the cases of just snake deaths. So we could evaluate what the prevalence is. So if you go back to that initial study that I showed you about reptile cancer, those are great, but a lot of their determining of prevalence or cancer in snakes is based off a single laboratory, uh, which that may be good, uh, but it may not be the whole story. It could be that institutions only submit samples to that laboratory if it's exciting or if they're sure it's cancer. 
Uh, or it could be they only do that if it's like a really big deal and then they submit somewhere else to a cheaper place. So it's not always getting the full concept. So that's why we're trying to get cases from as many different places as possible so we can get a truer prevalence. So looking at all of these snakes, we found that corn snakes and rat snakes were the most frequent snakes diagnosed with cancer. They're also the most commonly kept in zoos, aquariums, uh, and uh, other educational type facilities, most common pets. So it's like, of course they would have it because uh, there's a ton of them. So, but those with the actual most common prevalence were water snakes, the diamondback rattlesnake, timber rattlesnake, and cottonmouth. And you're like, well, those aren't commonly kept as pets. They're not even that super commonly kept uh, in zoos or aquariums. I mean, they're still common enough, uh, but most of those are venomous. Uh, so that takes a little bit more extra for dealing with them, treating them, et cetera. The most common cancers, uh, they were malignant most of the time, so 95% of them. So that's when it's like, oh, I saw a bump on a snake, whatever, you know, not a big deal. It actually kind of is if 95% of them are malignant. Uh, we did look at outcomes or survival, again, doing the COX boosting and found that we didn't see a difference in age, gender, or family of the snakes. We did to see that surgery was the most common treatment uh, and surgery and chemotherapy were associated with outcomes other than dying from cancer, which when you work with cancer and oncologists, dying from something other than cancer is considered a win. Because uh, it's like, hey, the cancer didn't kill it. They live long enough for something else too. Fabulous. Uh, so looking at this, the other thing is cool is like, okay, you're more likely to die from your tumors if it's malignant than if it's benign. Uh, great. That's wonderful. And that is exactly what we would expect. But it's always nice when the statistics show that too. Here's just another uh, example. So snakes can also get adenocarcinomas. Uh, it's been reported in the literature in king snakes. So this is one specifically. So this is where it's like now internal masses. Those are a lot harder to see. Snakes don't necessarily show these. So the only way to pick these up is if you do routine physical examinations on these animals to try to be able to diagnose that. Uh, this one is more obvious. You're like, look, yeah, it's bulging. I can tell that's a mass. It's pretty big. Uh, here's the ruler right by it. Uh, so we can see this. This is something that's more obvious. That said, this is one of those snakes where it's like, okay, yeah, it's got a bump. That doesn't look that exciting. This had already metastasized. Uh, so that's another example of just because it only looks like a skin bump, there's a lot more going on underneath it. Sarcomas, very common. Uh, so this one uh, had a sarcoma uh, at the cloaca and it was surgically removed. And then here he is getting radiation therapy. So if I diagnose a snake with cancer, we surgically remove it. We treat them with radiation at the surgery site as soon as possible. That said, snakes heal slowly, uh, so you have to wait for the surgery site to heal, which is about a month. Uh, in people, dogs, cats, it's usually about two weeks, uh, so it's kind of double what people are. Uh, but this animal is treated, still doing great, no recurrence of that. This snake, however, um, is actually... Um, we have fibrosarcomas. This one's actually an osteosarcoma uh, that is in the spinal canal here. And so you can see that it's affecting the entire spinal column in this region. The trick for this is one, diagnosing it. So you have to stick a needle into bone and hope that you get a sample that's appropriate for diagnosis trying to take a biopsy of something. So this animal is probably about two centimeters in diameter maybe three centimeters. So it's tiny. So trying to get something that's diagnostic and yet you're not going to break the snake. Uh, the other thing is that this is a common presentation of osteoarthritis in snakes too. 
So is it cancer? Is it arthritis? Uh, so I, just because I see that, I can't just say that it's going to be something that's treatable. Lymphoma is probably the most common cancer that I deal with across species. I actually was doing a consult on a snake, a king cobra today uh, with leukemia. Uh, and so that animal is probably going to get treated. Uh, so, but we have seen cutaneous lymphoma. Uh, we've seen, um, you know, bumps. We've also seen leukemia. Uh, the treatment for a lot of these, and most of the ones that have been diagnosed with lymphoma or leukemia are venomous. So just administering oral medications is now more dangerous depending on the type of the snake and if there is an anti-venine available. Uh, so, okay, how about oral treatments? Well, they may only eat once a week or once every three to four weeks. So is there a medication that you can do for that? Uh, there actually is. So lamustine uh, is something that we have done and others have done. And the dosing frequencies every four to six weeks, uh, it can cause their white blood cells to go down quite a bit, but it is something that we can use for treatments. So, um, so that is something else. Uh, cyclophosphamides, more a weekly treatment, so it's more frequent. It may be a bit safer and doesn't affect the white blood cells as much, but uh, I don't know if we definitely have something that I can say that for sure either way with either of them. Lizards are something that are emerging as kind of the hot spot of cancer. Uh, probably with bearded dragons being the winners. Uh, so there have been quite an increase in bearded dragons with cancer. We are looking at that specifically, trying to recruit cases of that. And from what I'm seeing, uh, I'm concerned there's a genetic component because they're all inbred. They're like the new in reptile pet, uh, or there could potentially be something viral that hasn't been diagnosed yet. Lymphoma also happens in lizards, uh, been published in uh, green iguanas. Uh, we have seen it uh, in bearded dragons, um, but in the literature in general, bearded dragons and green iguanas are overrepresented in the literature. We usually diagnose it by a blood sample <coughs> and uh, see if their lymphocytes are increased. There's various treatments that can be used, uh, and it just depends on which one, how bad, and how long to treat them. This is just showing the treatment that we did and what happened with the lymphocytes uh, for a bearded dragon. So this is when we started treatment for the animals, all of these. So these are various different types of treatments. And then, so the lymphocytes very high, dropped and then it started going back up. And so then it got another treatment, went back down. This is again showing the bearded dragons that we treated for leukemia. And again, showing the white blood cell count, the lymphocyte count and what treatment effects it has on the animals. So basically when it ends here shortly, that's because an animal, um, basically that's its survival time. But we did have some that uh, reached out to just over a year. Uh, so the treatments we use are similar to what has been used in people. They're kind of old school lymphoma treatments. If you talk to an oncologist, they're like, wow, yeah, that's so like 20 years ago. I'm like, yeah, that's where we're at. Um, not that newer treatments would uh, be better. It's just that perhaps we can't afford them. The owner can't afford them or we don't even know where to start with for animals for those treatments. Uh, so this is lomustine or CCNU. So that's uh, every three week to two months, depending on the white blood cells, it can cause quite a decrease uh, steroids and then uh, different types of chemotherapy. So l and cyclophosphamide have been used. And then we also give them antibiotics. Remember, for when we're treating a lot of these animals, we don't necessarily know the true dosage. We're trying to hedge our bets with 
I think this will work and it's not going to kill them. Uh, so, uh, but it still may cause the white blood cells to go down. That happens in people too. Uh, so it's not uncommon for people to also have antibiotics while they're treated uh, for cancer. Uh, this is just showing the lymphocytes of that animal. Uh, so for survival time, um, for those with lymphoma or leukemia, uh, we've treated over five bearded dragons now. There's been a cobra, a massasauga, and now I have another cobra that's going to be treated. Um, some of them survived days. Uh, for one of the bearded dragons, uh, it was pretty far gone when we diagnosed it. It was very sick. Uh, we tried anyway, uh, but less than a week survival for that animal. And then the others, we actually had over a year uh, until they came out of remission and we couldn't get them back. So it certainly depends on how the animal responds to treatment and how it goes, uh, but those are what we've seen so far. Uh, there's other types of cancers as well. Uh, squamous cell carcinoma has been found in lizards. Uh, we've also seen that in other animals as well, uh, and as well as carcinomas. Uh, kind of depends on where it's at uh, for the aggressiveness. Uh, they are not as bad as snakes in that everything's malignant, but we're also still certainly looking into it. Uh, have had some spindle cell sarcomas or myxosarcomas, uh, which start off looking just like a little bump, but this becomes very aggressive and spreads very quickly. So in this situation, they are more similar to snakes. Uh, this animal survived less than three months. Uh, so this is that same animal. We had surgically removed that mass uh, and this is the about one month later, it already came back. So that was surgical removal and it's already coming back. Uh, so we did treat it for radiation. So here's our radiation unit. Here he's getting that. We actually, for some of our animals, have to put um, like a gel kind of thing over them. Uh, so it fakes out the machine that they're bigger. Because again, these are like human type instruments. Uh, so people aren't that little. Uh, so we have to make the machine think that it's bigger to be able to make sure to get to the radiation at the right spot. Uh, we've seen some others that are not as aggressive, but can be um, annoying to that animal or spindle cell sarcomas. This is what it actually looks like. Uh, and it can grow in the joints. Uh, I've seen it in the toes, in the elbow, stifle joint. Uh, you can remove them, but they could also come back. So it's not necessarily something that's malignant per se, but more locally invasive. Now looking at amphibians, uh, so in this, we decided to do an evaluation of the literature, uh, went back to 1954 and looked at African, cla African clawed frogs, as well as axolotls, were the ones that are most commonly represented. Well, looking at that time frame, that's like everything that's used in human medical research and laboratory research. Uh, so no kidding, it's the top two most common uh, that are uh, you know, reported as having cancer. Uh, we did see that the average age was about five and a half years old, although the range was from zero to 18. I don't think the age is really zero. Uh, it's probably more like someone just recorded it wrong, not on our end, um, because I don't necessarily see tadpoles uh, with cancer. Uh, survival uh, from treatment was about seven months. And of the animals, there were more females than males. The most commonly reported cancers that we saw were chromatophoromas, lymphoma, leukemia that keeps occurring, and the skin was the most common site. Is the skin truly the most common site? Well, yes, in the literature and the potential bias that that becomes, but that's also the most easy place to notice it is you look and like, oh, there's a bump, must be cancer. Uh, 
treatment, again, the most common was surgery. If you see it, cut it out. Um, but the good news is that even uh, with surgery, it was most likely to have a positive prognosis and it was significant. Again, here we are doing the COX boosting. Uh, chemotherapy um, was attempted in a gray tree frog with uh, cutaneous lymphoma. I uh, did not survive very long, but it also was pretty bad at the time we started treatment. Uh, other treatments, so meloxicam is basically a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, kind of like uh, ibuprofen for animals, uh, but it does cause a decrease in blood flow so uh, or reduces it in some areas. So that could help kind of starve the blood flow off of the cancer. So overall, um, I would say if there is a reptile or amphibian or lizard, any of them, if a cancer is diagnosed, that it should be treated as soon as it's diagnosed, um, which again is very contrary to what you would think for a reptile because yeah, they do everything slowly except cancer. Uh, there are other animals, so I didn't talk much about crocodilians. Well, they, we don't have a whole lot of data on them uh, for getting cancer. I do have one case that I'm working on getting, um, or at least a few cases. Um, but for those animals, they tend to not have it and tend to have other issues. Uh, part of the problem with some of these reptiles and crocodilians included uh, is sometimes by the time a complete necropsy is done, uh, there may not be a good sample or um, a complete necropsy is just not done. Uh, so it may be that some of these cancers are underreported uh, because people aren't looking. Uh, we have also seen, especially in the amphibians, we did see that even just um, removing some of the tumor did have a positive impact on that animal. So even if the entire uh, cancer can't be removed. Even just removing some reduces the burden and does help them. So that is something at least to consider. Uh, if you know people, know a veterinarian, has some, uh, we do have a survey online. So that's where we do have that. Uh, I am collecting records. Please feel free to do it. Uh, this is also, that's snow. Uh, actually, it's uh and he successfully was treated for cancer. So that's his little party hat after completing his radiation treatments. So um, thanks to the following people for giving me some of the images and being involved with this and take any questions. Awesome, Dr. Harrison. Um, I think our first question we can start with is from Carlo. Um, so you talked about the differences in kind of metabolic processes and the speed and the difference between reptiles and different classes of animals. Uh, so Carlo asks, is there anything known or estimated about the number of mutations necessary to cause a cancer in different kinds of reptiles? I don't think we're even there yet. <laughs> so I have no idea. I mean, I would say that, I mean, I definitely at least clinically see a big difference in snakes compared to everything else. So I suspect there is, but I don't think we have that answer yet. Great. Um, so, so much of your talk was talking about translating things that we know about human cancers into treating some of these more exotic species. Um, is the opposite true for you? Is there anything that we can learn from, especially like reptilian cancers that can be translated back to our understanding of human cancers? I mean, I think there certainly is, because um, I think with snakes uh, in particular, they get some of the same cancers and it just goes so fast. So like, why are they having that and that it goes so fast? Or is that something that could happen in people, um, particularly like for some of the sarcomas? Because um, we've just had some primate sarcomas uh, that also went faster in the primates than typical in people. Uh, so that is... Um, something that it would be good to know and compare what's the difference between these and people and if there's uh, some other differences. I think the other thing that we can use from 
you know, animals to people is most of the time I'm doing like metronomic chemotherapy. Uh, basically, I'm making up doses and starting at a low level, hoping that I don't kill them. And that may be a better form of treatment for people as well, instead of just blasting them with the highest possible dose. So I think that's another thing that we could use um, animals for to do the other way. Awesome. Um, so Stephanie asks, so much of the comparative oncology literature shows that amphibians and lizards and turtles have such a lower prevalence of cancers than mammals and birds. Do you have any potential physiological explanations for this kind of divergence? Um, so for the why it's lower than mammals and birds, I mean, part of it could be metabolic, um, you know, since they have slower metabolisms, you know, life history, you know, things like that. Uh, so that could be part of it. I think the other part that I'm concerned, maybe not so much with turtles, I think people have looked at turtles, but then again, they also haven't. If you can't see an outside tumor in a lot of these animals, no one does a necropsy. So like in turtles, it's a pain in the butt to get inside that shell. Uh, so like you're using saws and power tools. Uh, so, and that's even when they're alive, sometimes you have to use uh, like a saw to get in to work on an organ. So I think a lot of times like it's not looked at. Uh, so. I'll, I'm kind of concerned that there may be a lot that are missing. Uh, the other thing is for some of these that are becoming like new popular pets, they're just being inbred excessively. So we they we may be selecting for some of these cancers uh, inadvertently. So I, I wouldn't necessarily, I mean, everyone does a necropsy on a bird and mammal because they like them better, potentially more charismatic. And then they forget sure. to do it on the snake or the lizard or, you know, amphibian or the animal um, is not done in an appropriate time. So it basically is decayed or, you know, not done. So in the looking for cancers level, birds and mammals win every day. Right. So in that, uh, in that thought of inbreeding. So lizards are bred in captivity. And so that the inbreeding seems like a plausible explanation. Are there other reptiles besides lizards that are highly bred in captivity or that inbreeding could be? I mean, there's definitely like, I mean, quite a few snakes are also bred in uh, captivity or under human care. And um, I mean, there's some uh, like whip tailed lizards are parthenogenic. So they don't even breed, they just reproduce themselves. <laughs> um, so that's like, there's a lot of them, but um, so, and there has been more breeding of amphibians uh, because of chytrid uh, fungus um, and the massive populations declines of amphibians. So there has been quite an increase in breeding those and not necessarily having the largest number of founding population for the breeders. Uh, so like the Puerto Rican crested toads, the Panamanian golden frogs, um, and the Wyoming toads are those that are being intensively reared right now. So, um, so those could be potentials. And we do, we are working with um, the Houston Zoo uh, because there has been a decent amount of cancers in Wyoming toads. Yeah, and I know at least for mammals in captivity, there's such an emphasis on inbreeding coefficients and keeping, you know, really detailed stud records and stuff like that. Are similar efforts in play when you're doing reptiles and amphibians? Kind of. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they do have that and they do have breeding recommendations like for the Puerto Rican crested toads and things like that. Um, and also for the snakes. Uh, so it does exist, but those species survival plans, there's fewer of them. Uh, so there's fewer managed populations and, um, and it's just not as common. Uh, so like compared to mammals, like, so like I help manage the tiger SSP and we're working with like hundreds of animals, but like for, you know, amphibians, yeah, there's like thousands of animals, but like you have one toad that produced 500 of them, you know, so right. it's like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's, you know, it's kind of, yeah, biased. And they are doing like head start programs where they'll breed them, release them, you know, et cetera. Um, 
but yeah, it, it, it is yeah. done. It's just not as intensively done or as done for as long as the mammals and even the birds. Sure. So uh, Pauline's curious about in these venomous snakes and the aggressive cancers that we see in them, I think a natural question that arises is, is there any potential relationship between the toxic or the toxicity of these venomous pathways in these snakes and carcinogenesis? Um, I'm not entirely sure. It's also like for those venomous snakes, like they can bite themselves and it doesn't affect them. So, right. so there's that. And I think they can bite each other and it doesn't affect them. So, cause it's, you know, so there's like some natural immunity against or protection against their own venom, um, potentially, or it could be that these animals, like they're not as commonly kept in zoos or aquarias. Uh, so the population founders were really low. So we inbred it into them. So that could be right. what we've seen. Uh, whereas those other snakes, like, yeah, we see them all the time, but it's not actually as common, but there's also like a way more of them. Right. Excellent. I think that covers the questions that are in front of me. Pauline, is that the case? Um, look in the chat, uh, Zach, because some people have been writing in, um, in the chat or, or yeah i've got the chat in front of me. That should be uh, addressed by tara i think um so let me see uh i guess carlo's curious is there ways that we can quantify some come to mind potentially but are there ways that we can quantify in the extent of inbreeding without direct uh genome sequencing mm, probably not <laughs> <laughs> i don't know <laughs> I mean, because like sometimes some of these exhibits could have multiple animals in one, like for turtles, like it's not uncommon for like an exhibit to have like 10 of them in there and you may or may not right. know which one bred. Uh, for snakes, um, a lot of the snakes are housed singly. So then when they put them together with something, it's more obvious <laughs> about who right. bred with who. Um, but yeah I, i'm not sure and then part of the issue is like some of these snakes like they came from the wild you have no idea what their genetics are right. it was um surrendered you know or whatever because some zoos have like former pets including venomous because um there's a lot of like drug houses or whatever that have you know cobras because oh. <laughs> welcome to my world <laughs> And uh, so one question, which I, I suppose you may have, have sort of answered, is there um, a similar amount of aggressive cancers in venomous snakes from different continents mm. that are genetically very distinct, you'd imagine? Um, I mean, that's certainly, that's not something that we've looked at yet, mostly most of our cancers are from here. We do have uh, London Zoo. Um, so that's a different one. Um, we are working with some people in Italy, but I don't think we've gotten a lot of records from them yet. So I think part of it is just like translating uh, and getting things, you know, into one spot. Uh, we have well, we've worked with Mexico. We've got a bunch from there, but that's basically same continent. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't, I don't know. Uh, so that's certainly something that we need to look at more. Mm. It's just so many interesting things. Um, uh, so Lee, who you, of course you know very well, Lee mm -hmm. Duke saying, um, and environmental components close to the ground wild yeah. versus hu in human care and location and that would be interesting to see so uh yeah any any thoughts about yeah, that I mean well yes I mean so the initial study of cancer actually in veterinary medicine was the evaluate it was the less the tumor registry of lesser vertebrates started out of the Smithsonian and focused exclusively on like amphibians and at the time a lot of those cancers uh, were contamination, in, you know, induced. Uh, so that was probably the first thing where people are like, oh, maybe we shouldn't put these things out into the random pond. Uh, so that was, you know, the initial start of 
you know, environmental cleanups, things like that, because amphibians were growing three legs and mm-hmm. wrong areas and things like that, as well as having tumors. Uh, so I think that's certainly uh, something. And yeah, with snakes, I mean, they're basically just completely on the ground all the time. They don't really have a choice to get off the ground. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, if there's, um, you know, contaminants in the environment, that certainly could have an effect on it. Um, we have seen um, like vitamin A deficiency type things and causing ear abscesses in turtles. And that was linked to like pesticides. Uh, so there certainly could be other things linked to it. And sea turtles, the fibropapillomas uh, was associated with contamination as well, or there were more of them where there was greater contamination of the water. Mm. Um well, fascinating. I think there's a couple more, some more questions um, in the Q and A. Zach, do you want to? Look I at think them? we've got them all. Okay. Um, Carlo repeated his. His was in the chat yeah. in the Q and A. Did you answer Stephanie's one in comparative oncology literature? It appears that amphibians and lizards, turtles have a lower prevalence of cancer than humans and birds. Yeah, no, I did talk about oh, that. Okay. Yeah, we got yeah. To that one. Yeah. So. Anyway. Okay. Any last minute questions in the chat or the Q&A? I think people are so overwhelmed with your presentation because there's so much in it, I think. <laughs> so much new stuff. Absolutely. Stuff that I haven't seen before. So really cool. No, we, we just didn't know anything about that. Um, yeah, it's, it, it's it, we're obviously still working <laughs> on it and trying to get a lot more, but um, I, I obviously see it from, you know, looking at the literature, looking at the stuff, and then also um, just when it comes in the door. But I think my biggest concern is just the the biggest change I've seen just since I've been doing this has been in bearded dragons and snakes. I, f- I feel that I'm seeing more aggressive uh, cancers in snakes as well as in bearded dragons. That's great. I think final question from Carlo, is there a good way to test the idea that inbreeding is leading to more cancer without sequencing a bunch of genomes? Uh, Yeah, I I think we had already talked about that. So yeah, I don't, probably not. (laughs) So we're, we're just behind in reptiles and amphibians. I think that's the biggest thing is like, like humans are here, dogs, and then like we're like not even registering with a lot of this. And it's, not enough. <laughs> I mean, it's most of the thing is like reptiles are cool, but they get a really bad rap. <laughs> so um certainly. <laughs> so like it's like, ooh, I could study cancer in tigers, and that's way cooler than studying cancer in a venomous snake, you know? So like where you're getting funding from it's not for the snakes <laughs> so right you know well i think want to thank you lee i mean this is uh and uh, so tara it's been a just a wonderful talk and uh we you know it's a completely new subject to most of us and it's been great and thank you very much zach for putting the questions just want to let to yeah. let people know that our next talk again i remind you it's james d gregory aging and disease must they go together and look for the registration details on our website, the Cancer Arizona Cancer Evolution Center. So yeah. much- thank you, Dr. Harrison. And thank you for everybody okay. that tuned in. I just I just listened to uh, James Gregory give a talk last weekend and his group's really hitting their stride on the big questions that have motivated his career. Uh, so we hope to see most of you there at our next seminar. Excellent. Thank, thank you all everyone. so much. And thank you for everyone for joining in. Okay, bye. Bye-bye.